Uh, it's great to be with you and to have the opportunity to address something that's one of the hot topics in American culture as I speak. And I do hope to leave some time for uh, questions at the end, but to enable people to get to their classes, uh, we will finish around 12.50. Uh, the outline of what I'm going to say has been posted, so I'm assuming everyone has access uh, to that, and I'll just work my way through it. Uh, addressing this issue of uh, same-sex controversy and life in the church today. I want to say right from the start, uh, something about the present climate of opinion. It has changed so rapidly. I think for many uh, people in the churches, especially of a conservative mindset, that rapidity has been head spinning. Uh, for example, according to Christian Century, that magazine, a poll taken in 2011 suggested that 44% of people polled thought that same-sex behaviour was a sin. One year later... 33%. And I think that percentage will keep uh, going down, especially in the light of the fact that uh, the present uh, president has affirmed same-sex relations, so the chief citizen of America has taken that stance. I think that has some flow on too. Hollywood, I think, has a lot to do with it. And the presentation of uh, same-sex relations, usually in an incredibly sanguine light, so the most likable people are the people who have same-sex relations. The best relationships are between those who have same-sex relations. And when you think of uh, some of the really winsome people on television, like Ellen DeGeneres, the most uh, popular TV host, who is uh, uh, a lesbian, that uh, makes it imaginable in a way that may not have been imaginable uh, 20, 30 years ago. And some of the things I say here, I'm saying, of course, as uh, an outsider, I'm not an American. So forgive me when I say that uh, I don't think American values and Christian values uh, overlap uh, at every point. And I would have thought uh, that American values um, will assist this change. What do I mean? The Declaration of Independence, it's an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so if same-sex marriage, same-sex relations are part of my happiness story, how can you deny that to me as an American citizen? I think that's a very powerful argument in the light of the founding documents of this country, which means, if I'm right on that, that if you're a Bible-believing Christian, uh, more and more you will find yourself in a cult counter-cultural situation, it seems to me, and feeling a pressure from the culture. And it is showing in the blogosphere where various uh, evangelical uh, leaders are suggesting that maybe it's time to be quiet on this issue, or maybe it's time to embrace this issue. And of course, there are those who say it's time to be salt and light and uh, to speak to the culture in a prophetic way. But I don't think uh, we will have the luxury of simply being quiet on this issue because I think the pressure will be on Christian people uh, to actually affirm LGBT lifestyles and celebrate them as a moral and public good. And it won't be sufficient simply to be quietest if you're known to be a Christian. At this point, I want to draw your attention to some distinctions that I think are wise ones that help clarity on this issue. One that I work with is the distinction between sexuality and gender. Sexuality having to do with my physiology, physicality, males can't get pregnant. Gender having to do with our roles in society, and those roles can indeed and have changed over time. There was a time when if men and women were in the church, they'd sit in separate parts in some denominations. 
I uh, don't think that happens that much anymore. So those things can change. Sexuality and gender distinction. And then there's a set of distinctions that I've learned from Mark Yarhaus, who's done a lot of work as a psychologist in this area of sexuality, which I find illuminating. He draws attention to what he's found to be a spectrum. There are folk in society who have a same-sex attraction. Sometimes they have fantasies uh, of a sexual relation with people of the same sex, for example. There are those, who, though, who have a same-sex orientation, according to Mark Yarhaus, where the majority of their fantasies and attractions are for people of the same sex. And there are those who affirm a same-sex identity. So if you ask such folk who they are, they're, the noun that describes themselves, from their own point of view, is lesbian or gay or bisexual or transgender the LGBT um, acronym that we become so much aware of, or Q, which we don't hear that much of as queer. But I'll say more about the Qs a little bit later. I think that the Bible writers didn't obviously work with these categories of gender, sexuality, same-sex attraction, same-sex orientation, same-sex identity, the concern in the, in the scriptures is with same-sex behaviour, which we'll get onto in a moment too, but I think these are wise distinctions that do help us clarify the situation we're in. The next point I want to make, I think, is absolutely crucial, and that is, in biblical perspective, we live in a broken creation. A creation that needs to be set to its rights. Uh, we're living in a new normal. Genesis 3 tells that story of how we've moved into what St. Augustine called the fall, or what Jacques Ellul, the great French lay theologian, called le rapture, the rupture of relationships, created relations, the fabric of relations. So there is disorder in the world. Uh, St. Paul puts it very starkly in Romans 1 to 3 when he says, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's design for life. In fact, Romans chapter 8, St. Paul says, creation itself needs to be redeemed, set free from this disorder. <laughs> and is longing for that occasion when the great finale to history comes and the glorious liberty of the children of God is made clear and revealed, and in that destiny, the created order will share. 2 Peter 3 speaks of a new heavens and a new earth to look forward to, in which righteousness is at home. And the very last couple of chapters in the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, likewise speak of that new heavens and that new earth, where relationships are indeed set right. And there's no curse, there's no death, there's no crying anymore. Why this, I think, is so important is, as Augustine pointed out in one of his writings, there's correct reasoning that can be found outside the church, but there are some propositions for our thinking about that are only to be found in the church's holy books. And one of those key claims has to do with the new normal or from a Christian perspective, the abnormal that we live in. And if you don't share in that perspective, then what you see on the plane of history and in the society that you live in is simply normal, natural. But with your Bible open, we live in abnormality that needs to be set right. And I think the clash between the <coughs> worldviews that affirm such a fall and the worldviews that don't will be the flashpoint on this particular issue. Because I want to say that there is a divine design for sexual expression that we find in the scriptural testimony starting in Genesis uh, chapter 2 famously 
of a man leaving his father and mother and being glued to his, uh, to his wife to become one flesh. And that one flesh uh, union is a pre-fall reality. And it's reaffirmed by our Lord himself in Matthew 19 when he addresses the issue of divorce. That from the beginning, this is how it was to be. Man and woman in a one flesh union. And St. Paul also affirms that. He does so in two places. He does in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and then in a well-known passage in Ephesians 5 about marriage. That this is where husband and wife are to find themselves in a one flesh union. There is a design for the expression of human sexuality and it is in a male and female union. Covenant is how the book of Proverbs and Malachi would put it, in which there is uh, faithfulness within and chastity without it on the outside of that relationship. And this is not a kind of grim duty, <coughs> as though God likes to create uh, hair shirts for creatures so that they can just live in discomfort. Just read the Song of Songs and you'll find how much this union can be a, an, an occasion for celebration and delight. There's a very positive story to tell about the context for sexual union. That's important because the temptation for Bible-believing people is only to tell the negative story. To simply draw attention to the texts that proscribe, forbid, criticize same-sex relations. So the impression is given that God is a God who is the enemy of human pleasure. So the positive story, as well as the negative story needs to be told. And getting to that negative story, we move to the same-sex texts. I'm not going to elaborate a great deal on these various texts because I want to allow plenty of time for questions. And everyone does the ethics course, or what will be the doctrine and ethics course as a student, and we will spend several hours working through this material. So I'll leave a lot of the discussion in detail to them. What we do find in the scripture with the six texts that I think do speak about same-sex relations is that none of them endorse same-sex behavior. It's a wholly negative story. At this point, I might just point out this is one difference between this and the issue of women's ministry that often gets uh, lumped together with it because uh, the Bible is for women's ministry where Bible-believing Christians differ is the scope of it, because there are positive texts about such ministry. But we don't find any positive texts about same-sex relations, starting in Genesis 19 and the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Yes, from the prophets we learn about violence and, and inhospitality there. But Genesis 19 is pretty clear that it's homosexual rape that's on view that the men of the city want to get to know these men who turn out to be angels, and the judgment of God on that is fierce. And then in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 22, we find that in this material that I think belongs together, because in Leviticus 18 it's about, don't be like the people you've left behind, don't live like the Egyptians you've left behind, and then by the time you get to chapter 20, don't be like the people you're going to live among, the Canaanites or their particular culture that you're going to reject, be holy as the Lord is holy in Leviticus 19. And part of that story is same-sex relations are an abomination. That's the biblical language. But I think if you read it in terms of the literary unit of which it's part, I think it's talking about an entire style of life that belongs to a pagan world because what's very interesting is that when you get into the New Testament, the language of abomination doesn't appear reaffirmed, reasserted. Uh, what we do find, though, is like the Old Testament, sin is sin, but I think Leviticus 18 and 20 has a particular uh, framework that it is uh, 
uh, creating about how Israel is to be a distinct people in the world. Judges 19, we have another story of threatened homosexual rape, and it's a disastrous story for the poor concubine who's thrown uh, to, these, uh, to these men to indulge themselves, and it is just testimony to a time in Israel's history when people did what was right in their own eyes, and there was no king as the agent of the divine rule over God's people. Moving to the New Testament and famously in Romans chapter 1, uh, St. Paul talks about what the pagan world is guilty of before God and how God responds. God responds in his uh, wrath, which is his righteous anger. It's not some kind of celestial uh, temper tantrum as a God's off Prozac for the day. It's not like that at all. It's what holiness does in reaction to what is wrong and evil and out of kilter with God's character and what God does as a way of judgment is to give people up to the folly of their behavior. And so in Romans 1, same-sex relations are the actual judgment that people are given up to. And then in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, we find an amazing story of transformation. Because although those Corinthians were a pretty rum lot, that is to say, uh, what a mixed bag in terms of uh, behavior, and I could just spend a lot of time on the Corinthians and how not to do church. <laughs> but even so, St. Paul can say, well, some of you were like this once, including uh, people who seem to have been taking the part of the penetrator in same-sex relations and the penetrated in same-sex relations. But through the gospel, you have been transformed and changed. And then in 1 Timothy 1, that is reaffirmed. That same-sex behavior is seen by St. Paul as part of the lawlessness, lawlessness part of sin. So I can't find a positive text in the scriptural testimony about same-sex relations. So on the positive side, I have the story of one flesh union from Genesis 2, Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 6, and Ephesians 5. And on the downside, the negative story from Genesis 19 to 1 Timothy 1. Which leads me to the issue of marriage, which has become an essentially contested concept because of the push to expand the definition of marriage, to make it broader than the coverage of simply a male and female union. And in a number of states within the United States, that is now the case, isn't it? That the definition has been so expanded. Uh, there are lots of groups in society who would like to see that expansion uh, furthered to include not only male and male relations, female and female relations in every state, but also polygamy, polyandry, and polyamority, which is where couples marry couples, and so on. So there are, there are more groups interested in this question of how to define marriage than you might realize. But what you may not know, because I don't think the media makes any issue of this, I've never seen it <coughs> thematized in the media, is that uh, there are people in the LGBT communities that reject same-sex marriage. And I'm especially thinking of the Qs, the queers, because in books like Against Equality by uh, Ryan Conrad and Yasmin, Nair, which they've edited, and in the blogosphere, people who identify themselves firstly as Q argue that same-sex marriage is a sellout to the straight world, a sellout to the bourgeoisization, if you like, <laughs> of what otherwise is a very free, sexually free lifestyle that should be celebrated. So... Same-sex marriage is also a contested concept amongst folk you'd otherwise think would affirm it. But in terms of our own response here as Christian people, members of churches, here I think we need to embrace a distinction between giving offence to people and people taking offence at us. 
from what I read in Scripture, we are under obligation as Christ's people not to give offence to people. If you read 1 Corinthians 10, St. Paul aimed at not giving offence to Jew or Gentile or the Church of God. He sought to imitate Christ in all things. In Romans 12, he says, live at peace with everyone. Our Lord said, blessed are the peacemakers, if you recall. But there's a difference between seeking not to give offence and people taking offence at what you say and how you live and what you won't do or won't endorse. Uh, I've debated uh, gay folk uh, publicly because for a number of years in Melbourne Diocese I was the Archbishop's spokesperson on sexuality and human relations. So I found myself uh, in this sort of uh, forum more than once. And one of my uh, gay uh, Christian friends said to me after we debated each other publicly, Graham, your, your position was uncompromisingly traditional but pastoral. Tonality is really important in postmodern times. How we say things often is more eloquent for people than what we actually say. And there is a difference between the way we say things if we aim to wound, if we aim to express <coughs> self-righteousness, and a way that we express ourselves that shows something of the gentleness of Christ, but also the integrity that we live under as Christian people. Because what the world won't see and understand is that given that biblical moral axiom that relationship brings a responsibility with it, we have a relationship to a Lord which brings a responsibility with it, which they can't see, uh, which animates us, but is hidden from them. And so what may be seen as adopting an, an totally unacceptable position in our social context increasingly, for us is a matter of the faithful following of Jesus Christ as Lord. Which brings me to my second last point to make. And just to remind ourselves of the objects of Christian love. Because uh, the bedrock of our moral behavior is that we are people uh, animated by agape, by that love we see in Christ. And that love directed towards God is fundamental, isn't it? In Matthew 22, it's the, the great commandment to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But our Lord said there's another just like it, which is to love our neighbor as ourselves in Matthew 22. He also made it clear in John chapter 13 in that upper room that we are to love one another. Indeed, that is to be the mark of the Christian. By this all shall know that you are related to me because... There is that self-sacrificing, other person-centered regard that showed itself in John 13 with washing disciples' feet and having that servant mentality. But also, according to our Lord, we are to love our enemies in Matthew 5. And the fact of the matter is we'll find gay, lesbian, bisexual and transgender and Q people in each of those categories. We'll find them as brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll find them as neighbours. We'll find them opposed to us, very vociferously in some cases, um, who see us as enemies. There's no excuse, friends, then, for that uh, hateful speech and action that degrades the other in the light of uh, a God who so loved the world and of a Christ who died for the ungodly <laughs> while we were yet sinners. So friends, uh, we need to remind ourselves of how we are to conduct ourselves. And in so doing, remember, it's one thing for people to take offence, it's another to give offence. 
Let me give an illustration of that distinction. It's not on this issue, but it does illustrate, I think, the distinction. I was conducting an evangelistic mission south of Sydney at a place called Ferry Meadow, and someone in the church had got to know a science academic from the University of Wollongong who had started to get interested in religion. So a number of uh, meetings were arranged where we could dialogue on these things. So it started in a very general way, talking about the nature of the universe. And Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time had come out. And uh, so this really was uh, something motivating his side of things in talking about um, the universe and the possibility of a creator. Because he'd come to the view over many, many years that materialism just didn't explain. So there had to be something more. And we were going really well over several meetings. We'd even got to the Dead Sea Scrolls and what I thought about those. And on, and on it went. And he got to that position where he said, there has to be something more. And I remember saying to him this afternoon, indeed there is. And you know that something more actually is someone more. And that someone more became human and lived among us, and his name is Jesus Christ. I was out the door in 30 seconds. He just got up, took me to the door, and showed me out. And that was the end of it. Um, he had taken offence because of that scandal at the heart of the gospel of Christ and his cross. But as far as I know, what lies within me, I tried to exhibit the gentleness of Christ in dialoguing with him. So we may find ourselves indeed being shown the door. As for reading, uh, there are some things on the Gospel Coalition website that I draw your attention to, and you've probably uh, got access to that through the uh, outline that was posted. But... Christopher Ash has written a 15,000-word essay on sexuality that I draw your attention to. And Mark Yarhouse has written one on homosexuality, which I draw your attention to. I've also given a seminar on this subject at a Gospel Coalition uh, conference on homosexuality, hermeneutics, and pastoral wisdom. And it's interesting that I got an email last night from someone overseas who had actually accessed that um, seminar and uh, had heard it and was asking for more material. It's amazing how things get around. But there's one particular link that I really want to draw your attention. It's by the man of the unpronounceable name. Uh, is it uh, Tabiti Anya Bibule? <laughs> Uh, he's an African-American pastor and he has written a very interesting article about what white Christians in the present cultural climate can learn from people who've been a moral minority, an ethnic minority in this society, and what we may learn from the African-American Christian experience. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that particular article, and I draw your attention to it. Two books. Washed and Waiting by Wesley Hill, who's a theologian at Trinity School of Ministry in Pittsburgh. Uh, he has always, as far as he's known, had a same-sex attraction and orientation, but his identity is Christian. And so that's how he would identify. And therefore, in the light of the biblical testimony, he has adopted a celibate uh, lifestyle. But one of the things that he mentions and makes uh, very clear in this, that for folk who've embraced that vocation, that gift of singleness, which is a gift in biblical terms, just as marriedness is, need friendship and hospitality from their brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, not isolation and rejection. This other book is a fascinating book by Rosaria Champagne Butterfield, <laughs> The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Um, she was uh, in charge of queer studies at Syracuse University for a number of years, a uh, lesbian, uh, got um, involved in a dialogue with a Presbyterian pastor, <laughs> and over several years very reluctantly got converted. <coughs> 
And uh, one of the things that stands out about this story of hers is that uh, if you're gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, then you really do have a communal experience of people who are similar to yourself. And the loss of that really weighed very heavily on her. That was a great cost for her to follow Christ. And to give an address at Syracuse University where, as she said, she came out of the closet, but as a Christian, um, it meant uh, breaking up a lesbian partnership. They owned two houses between them. And ultimately, uh, you know, a loving church that embraced her with all her questions and struggles uh, has led her into um, a very different life as the wife of a Presbyterian pastor uh, has been for a number of years. So two books that I would recommend to you. 